in the area of sociology, first of all, and sociology of humor in particular. Um, she, well, there's a few things we have in common with this. Uh, we have a great friend and uh, mentor, um, Professor Christy Davies. Uh, a lot of people know him here because he also taught at this uh, college for, for a month uh, already nine years ago. Uh, and he was a great influence on the way we understand scientific humor and we understand ethnic humor in particular. So I, I thought I would mention uh, his name. Selinda um, uh, Kaupis is also an author of an influential book on humor called um, Good Humor, Bad Taste, um, published uh, already some time ago and refers to the idea of highbrow and lowbrow culture, um, uh, lowbrow humor and highbrow humor in the Catholic cultural prison. Uh, she taught at various universities in the Netherlands, including Amsterdam and Rotterdam, uh, and also now she's uh, based out from this year at the University of uh, Leuven. And this is not the first time that uh, she's here, she was uh, here before, uh, having Twice before having lectures. So, Miss Linda, welcome back and I'm uh, looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. So, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm happy to be back in Kurosawa. Uh, so, let's start with Emma. Saying that um, he um, 
he, he, this, well, the long story is that you can see sort of also the way he presents. So he says, I, um, I know someone, a friend of mine, and he's making movies, and uh, also doing the casting. And uh, next time he's making the movie on uh, Nazi Germany, and then two of his colleagues in Parliament. Uh, I'll recommend you for the role of Kaplan, so Nazi camp officer. And then he has very interesting, so he's very good at timing. So he's I remember you for the role of Kaplan. This is the number of beats, and he says, well, you, you'd be perfect. And it's actually so it's a joke. Uh, so it really, you can also see from his face how he thinks it's a joke. But it's also uh, not a very polite uh, sort of intervention. Um, it's uh, a great insult, really. And it's something that at the time, so this is 16 years ago, drew a lot of attention because it was so outrageous, and I think it's interesting if you see now that it actually looks very, very familiar, because we have a lot of these outrageous, mocking, insulting, uh, transgressive uh, politicians now who are doing these sorts of weird things and also using the media to get a lot of attention. So this is the sort of political style. Uh, that I want to sort of quickly dissect now and also think how it's related to political polarization because I create the what the Italians of course know really and knows as soon as actually that we used to think of Italy as a country that was politically backward, I think for a long time in the north of Europe. And now the opposite is to we think that actually in Italy everything happens before it happens in all the other places. And that is uh, not a happy thought, I can tell you. So, because now we have these people, and I'm using mostly the, the 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 English, the British, and the American examples because I know this is something that we all will recognize. So this is the problem of doing uh, international research, and we always end up referring to the Americans and the Brits because that's what everybody understands. Even though there are other examples that are maybe more good, because they do the same thing. So they also have this outrageous style where they use a lot of mockery, they use a lot of humor, and they do a lot of transgressive things. It draws a lot of, it attracts a lot of media attention, a lot of outrage, a lot of people, a lot of debate, and it's actually a style that works and that is a very fitting, I will, I will argue, to the current polarized political um, landscapes. Uh, so these are the Dutch ones, so I'm not expecting you to know them. There's actually a few of them, so there's been a sequence of uh, polarizing political leaders on the right. So these are called, this is the Democracy Forum, Forum for Democracy. Uh, this is the other Dutch one, so it also happens on the left. So we try to think about this pretty often, because this is something that helps us on the right end of the political spectrum of this is from an immigrant, sort of left-wing immigrant party called Denk. So this is the leader of this Dutch party who is, as like you can see, he's getting himself arrested uh, because he's walking through Jerusalem with the Palestine flag. And it's actually it's the same sort of, it's sort of mocking, it's provoking, it's out to make people angry. He was obviously trying to get himself arrested. Um, so it's a style that is sort of humorous and very provocative. So politicians, are increasingly behaving like comedians. They're using the communication style, they're taking the freedoms of comedians, they're using a lot of humor, they're creating this sort of transgressive sphere around them of I can do anything I want, which is something that we associate with the stage of stand-up comedy, where you know, comedians have this sort of liberty of doing whatever they want because they're comedians, except it's not serious. Politicians using a lot of the same tricks and styles, including the, the management of the media. At the same time, we also have, as anything, we have comedians that uh, become very active in politics. Again, Italy leading the way, so this is Beppe Grillo, who founded the Five Star Movement, which became uh, for a while the largest political party in Italy, not anymore. Uh, but also, something that you may not know, also in Iceland, after the crisis in Iceland, there a comedian. Uh, became the mayor of Reykjavik with in his program the promise to not keep his promises, which is a very comedic, comedic instrument, but also the promise to provide free uh, towels in all the bathhouses of Reykjavik, a promise that he did not keep, of course. Uh, and also 
very recently, very close here in Ukraine, we have the community. So we have a very interesting sort of convergence where comedians are moving into politics with programs that are not very easy to figure out, and with politicians who actually adopt many of the sort of strategies and styles of comedians. So mostly, this style is associated with populist parties who are more influential on the right, I would say this is for Europe and for North America, even though you also see it on the left. So it's more has to do with the populist style than with the political content per se. And it happens in this context of increasing political polarization, which we see uh, throughout Europe and the US. So this is the question I would like to ask today. So the role of humor in this political social polarization that we see today. So quickly, also something very, very quickly about what I think humor is. So I've I published about this before, so it's just a summary, so to give you a sense of notion of what sort of approach I take. So I don't really think that it helps to give definitions of humor, uh, because they tend to be very slippery and very contested. But what I do see is that there are a number of ingredients that you see in humor around the world. And I think these ingredients it helps you to understand how humor works as a form of communication. So one is that humor is connected with laughter. And laughter, importantly, is uh, an emotional experience, but it's also a social experience. So it's something that you share with others and that gives a positive feeling. So it's about, and it's also it's a very strong shared experience in the sense that something that we all probably experience. So if you enter a place and you'll see, you'll hear people laughing, you will want to know what is going on. Even though, because when people are laughing together, this suggests that they have, they share something, that there's something that is connects them and you want to be part of it. So it's a very strong signal of togetherness. And I think that's very important for understanding it. So Lacks for pleasure sociability. Uh, all humor is based on a sudden, surprising, unusual thing, which is called incongruity. And very often, this incongruity makes sense if you take it a little further. From first, it seems to be surprising, but then if you look a little further, there is some sort of logic. Uh, to it. In this specific case, I'm not really sure, but incongruity is something that we see in all forms of humor around the world. Thirdly, um, humor is not serious. And not serious is a very complicated, discursive, social, and communicative thing. So, what it means, first of all, that if you say something by way of a joke, uh, it is not to be taken literally. It's not both applied as um, how I think I said yesterday. So it's not uh, meant to be believed or not meant to be taken seriously. So this is something that you can signal in many ways, for instance, by like having a very funny face or by putting a kettle on your head, but clearly it shows that then you're not being serious. But it also means that the consequences of what you're saying are not exactly serious or that it's somewhat ambiguous. So you leave up in the air if something has to be believed or not. And this is something that makes possible a lot of functions that humor can fulfill as a form of communication. So non-seriousness. Uh, then fourth, humor very often is about things that are a little sensitive, a little painful, that are uh, a little that are about two subjects. So humor is transgressive. So this is not always the case, but very often you will see that humor has some element of transgression of doing something or saying something or referring to something that should not be said or cannot be done. So it opens up and it's actually this non-seriousness that opens up this possibility of all these transgressions. Because first you say, look, I'm not serious, you're not supposed to believe me, so then I can walk around in very bizarre sort of uh, like we'll have here. And then finally, humor also because of this uh, non seriousness, it actually it pulls things down. There is, it takes things not seriously, so it makes them smaller, and that often also may become ridicule or aggression or hostility, especially if you sort of direct it upward. It means that you make something that is powerful, that you 
big and small. So this can work both in a sort of good way of centering the two classes. You have the, uh, the person who is your superior or who is empowered, but it also can work downwards. So you also really people who degrade people that are already uh, lower in status than you. So it goes all ways. Um, so you make something smaller by not taking it seriously. And it can work against you because the cartoonist who actually made this uh, image and published it lost his job very quickly afterwards. So it's not without risk and increasingly it's not without risk. So what, because of these ingredients, humor is a very complicated form of communication. Uh, so it's really, it's really a miracle that we managed to pull this off successfully several times a day that we actually make a joke that is picked up by many people in our surroundings and that makes them laugh because so many things are happening at the same time there the has to be balanced so carefully it's really a miracle that we can do this but also it can perform a lot of different functions and many of these functions have to do with the marking of social and cultural boundaries so who belongs who doesn't belong who's in on the joke who isn't in on the joke who's laughed at who's not laughed at and consequently also what is what you can do, what you cannot do, what is morally right, what is morally wrong, all of this is very often encapsulated in uh, a joke. Um, and it's also interesting because of this ambiguity that's in there, it also it very often is mixed with a number of different emotions. So it's not just fun or pleasure, but it can be aggression or disgust or disdain or exhilaration. So there are many other feelings that can be part of it. So it's not just one feeling, but many other feelings. And because of this, you can actually use it in many different ways. Also. So that's humor. So then what is polarization? So this is something that actually has been written about a lot recently because polarization is something in politics and also in society that goes uh, up and down. So there has been a period, at least in the West, of decreasing polarization. So parties would also be politicized. So become more similar, but now we have the opposite. So what happens in polarization, the middle is weakening or disappearing, which is something that we've also seen in recent elections in Spain. Uh, so social and political groups increasingly drift apart because they define themselves in opposition to the other. So they say, we are X because they are I. Um, so if groups actively cultivate these group boundaries, they really say, so we are totally not them. We are so not them. We are really, really, really never them. So that is something that is repeated, but I'm sure in the Polish context you recognize this. And then these group identities become increasingly central to self-identity. So this is something that is very well documented in the United States, where uh, political parties increasingly become the core of the identity. People, for instance, will say, I really will not want my son or daughter to marry someone of the other political party, or I would not want to, my neighbors to be Democrats. So this is, and then your political identity becomes your self-identity, your personal identity. So this is a people in Europe have a strong perception that this is what's happening in their country, so that divides are there and that they're becoming bigger. So you see also, do you in Poland, also in here? So in Poland, as you can see, people are really saying that their country is more divided than 10 years ago. In Europe, most people say that their country is most divided and getting more so. Uh, so this is really something that is going on. And my suggestion is that this new political style is contributing to this development. So it's reflecting it, but also speeding it up. So how does it do that? I'll just give you some examples of the five main strategies or the five main ways that I see this happening. Uh, and I'm actually building on a small but growing body of literature in human studies on uh, political humor and conflict. So there is a book by Paul Lewis with actually quite a visionary book because this was already published in 2008 when we wrote about cracking up so how humor uh, functions in political conflict and also 10 years old the limits of humor by Sharon Lockyer and Michael Pickery the literature is much bigger now but these are sort of the founding books there uh, so the first thing that we see that 
politicians are doing is you were to attack and mock. So think of Berlusconi who is calling his German colleague a capo and laughing. So it's presented as a joke, but it's also an attack. And that's something you see very often. So it's a specific form of humor that is really deeply aggressive. Interestingly, this does not happen very often. So this is not the most common because most politicians are embedded in a parliamentary system where the direct attack is risky and will sort of have some tendency to sort of explode in their face because it's if, so if you ridicule others directly, it's a very strong breach of relations. So you're really putting yourself up on the chart. There are some uh, examples. This is in the Netherlands. So this is the previous big political <coughs> right wing leader who is actually, and this is interesting, who was the biggest one builders from the Freedom Party, but is now being succeeded by another party that is more uh, presentable or more sort of reasonable, and he is increasing radicalizing, which means that. Uh, he is ex also starting to attack so Ruth is the current prime minister of the Netherlands. And he has said in Parliament, uh, by way of sort of a joke, the whole Netherlands does not even know if, has, if he has ever had a women. So the prime minister is a bachelor. So that is thanks actually mockery and an attack. It's pretty insulting. Um, I have to say our prime minister is not my party, but pretty good for responding to this. But this is an example of direct attack and mockery where you really place yourself outside of the border. Um, also, the other sort of the left wing immigrant party, they with the guy with the flag, also does this. Also, with the left of two examples. So, this is their YouTube channel. They're actually very active, all of them, as really as you can imagine. So, here, Rutte, prime minister or servant, is actually Knecht, is actually a, a worse name than servant, but I couldn't really come up with before. Rutte or an egg. So, this is really the direct attack which you see. On the both sort of the extreme ends of the political spectrum. Uh, in the US, things have gone a little further, and there Trump actually is attacking his opponents all the time. And one of the things that Trump is doing is, I think this is sort of really it's interesting if you look at his Swiss economy sort of the logic of, of the, the schoolyard. So he's making up names for each of his opponents and constantly referring to them by sort of these semi-funny, mocking names rather than the beautiful or family, um, crooked Hillary, lying and leaking games for me, her, Lisa Page and her psycho lover, and then also Bob Miller, who was in charge of this investigation, he always consistently calls him the highly conflicted Bob Miller. So he keeps so his name calling, and the name is sort of exaggerated, so there's also there is element of humor in there. So you mock people by attacking them and by sort of having these sort of non-serious names. Uh, of course, in the UK, Nigel Farage also very sort of becoming more extremely mocking uh, in a sort of uh, jocular, non-serious, disdainful tone that he constantly has. Look it up if you don't know him. Uh, it's very difficult. It's Difficult in two ways. So one, I said it's really difficult because if you really put yourself outside of the order, so once you've done that, it's actually very difficult to get back into sort of the, the, the actually working, functioning uh, politics, which is something you see with Trump. So he really, there's no way to, of course, sometimes the system thought they could sort of encapsulate him, well, they can't. It's really, he's using a different term. It's also very difficult, if, if you do it, it's also important because it's also very, very difficult to respond eloquently if you try to be a rational, decent, reasonable, political person who wants to come up with solutions. So it's very difficult to respond to this and remain dignified. So it's it's a radical move, but once it happens, it really leads to a break of populations. The second thing you can do, oh, goodbye. <laughs> the second thing you can do that's a little less um, Risky or disruptive to your relations is to provoke the opponent into undignified behavior. So by being not mocking them directly, but by being so outrageous that your political opponents will uh, will lose it, basically. Now this is something that you see a lot because it's actually much more effective than what happens uh, 
uh, when you directly mock or ridicule people. Uh, again, Donald Trump does this all the time and is very open about it. So he's recently he started saying that uh, they would that he would be interested in having another term, and he's keeping saying that again and again. And currently, he is presenting it still, I think, as a way to uh, anger his opponents and saying this in sort of relative ways. He's trying to be crazy by saying this all the time. Uh, so this is this sort of more respectful that version of Terry Dorgodes, of the respectful version. So he does this all the time, and like many others, right wing is onto women. So he's very anti-feminist, so he has a routine of baiting feminists. So, and this also presented, so this is from their own YouTube channel, so they use it. So he's actually saying, well, of course, women are different. He says so it's really better if women stay at home, children, and uh, not meddle with politics, and um, so all women want to be raped. He says things like that, and then he says it's a joke, and then of course everybody's angry, and then he's called that, and nobody can accept it. Real truth that I'm saying is here. So here, this is what happens when so parties take issue with Hodes statements about women, euthanasia, and abortion. So it's it's baiting, it's provoking, and then making your opponents angry because anger doesn't deliver. And there's sort of a half mocking, humorous undertone very often, which is very easy. And then if your opponents are angry or provoked, you can mock that too because they're losing it. You're also what you're saying. Just talking about the book The third thing that we see is more indirect. So the first and second really are about forms of attack, really about highlighting conflict of attacking others or to uh, uh, provoking them. The third is about building community through laughter. Can I ask why you're all leaving? There are classes, yes. I'm just wondering. Okay, well then enter your class. So the third thing is more indirect, and this is something that you see uh, very often in well, not only in the political appearances of right politicians, but also if you see footage of the meetings of especially the right wing uh, uh, gatherings, that there is a lot of laughter and humor there. So I'm not sure if you've ever looked at the rallies of Trump, uh, but it's really interesting how much laughter is going on, and there are many, so I didn't want to show it because it takes so long, but look it up, because what Trump does is he actually lets a lot of jokes, and then he takes a lot of time to really sort of allow the laugh to sort of roll through, through like waves and waves, so he's really provoking the laughter and letting it sort of um, move be there for a long time to, for this very strong sense of community that laughter creates. So it reinforces the in-group, so we're all things together, we're the same people, we see the world in the same way, and it's an exhilarating feeling that is very often called upon. Uh, and I have one clip that I want to show you to see how this humorous style actually helps to sort of uh, build this sense of community. Uh, because there's actually, after the so uh, before the election of Boris Johnson uh, to become the, the leader of uh, the Conservative Party, which meant also the Prime Minister, he did a tour of the UK. He was the members of the, the Conservative Party had to vote for him, and he used a lot of humor. And there was a lot of clips also on YouTube just about the way Boris was using his humor. So the humor was really also invoked as to. to Create this sense of in-group feeling. So it's us together, we see the world in the same way. Uh, so, one of those. I cannot <coughs> swear that I've always observed a uh, top speed in this country 70 miles an hour. I, 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 I'm going to. I'm going to. The employment has fallen to the lowest level since 1972. Exports have soared. English football teams have won both the Champions League and the UEFA Cup. By beating other English football teams. <laughs> we said that we'd do 100,000 homes, and we did, we did slightly more than that. That's not a huge number more, but slightly more. Uh, I'm going to go now to George Barker of the Financial Times, or Mon Journal Préféré, as Jacques Delors used to say. See you later. Thank you. Uh, so, what I'm doing very much, um, the 
one of the interesting things is that I discovered when I was looking at all these clips is that one of the things that Boris Johnson would do is say, Jacques Delors, and then wait for a bit. And apparently there is a strong in group joke here. So some of these in group jokes is just because it's just referring to things, not joking yourself, but having this sort of knowing we understand each other. We are in the same sort of. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you suggested that Brexit would be as foreign secretary, you offended people at home and abroad, you know, and already in this campaign, you're telling some supporters who will do everything to avoid leaving the EU. It's a simple question. If you want to be prime minister, can the country trust you? Well, yes, of course, Laura. And the answer, I think, perhaps in that uh, great ministry of observations, was one substantive question, uh, which was, which was that. Uh, one crouton uh, I, I, I picked up, which was that uh, you, you think that I've been somehow inconsistent. Mr. Johnson, you brandish your Brexit credentials, but many of your colleagues worry about your character, your foreign office, your character, your character, uh, your foreign office. What you get the point? So when you say that you're not about the new 
uh, populist right, which I think is something that, uh, well, at least in the Netherlands and in Western Europe, hasn't happened since the 1970s. And then it was something that I died out very quickly when the former hippies became reasonable people and joined politics. But now we have politicians who claim the sort of comedic freedom or the freedom of the fool, uh, and they claim it and they keep claiming it when they're still in power. And that's a really, it's a really new thing. Uh, so this notion of the, well, I showed this already. So comedians um, can be kind non, they can be non-serious, they can be inconsistent, they can be transgressive because they're comedians. So this is the sort of the contract that we have with these people. So they are on this different place, they're in this different world, they're non-serious. And they say they can do all the things that we cannot do. So it's a very specific form of privilege, but traditionally it came with the prize. So the prize is that you're a comedian and you're not serious. So you're in this different world where you do things that are not directly real. So there is a strong boundary. So there is, uh, I'll put a little bit. So there is, for instance, a boundary that is between the carnival and the serious world. They're between the political and the, so this is, and in, the, in German this is called not a I don't know it's a freedom of the fool. Uh, so this freedom comes with a price. So you can do anything you want at a specific moment, in a specific period, during a specific, I'm not sure if Poland has carnivals, you have, do you? Yes? So, so if you have a carnival, so it works. So it comes with the delineation. And what happens with these new politicians is actually that they're breaking, they're, they're breaking these boundaries. So they keep being outrageous, taking this freedom, uh, well, they're still in power, so increasingly they sort of, and I think this is very, that's also why I wanted to show you um, the Johnson quote that I just had um, shown before. Because someone is, a journalist is actually telling him, look, you're inconsistent. You're saying one thing and doing another and saying something else and saying something else. And it's sort of a rational world of politics. This is a really terrible thing because you want to have a politician that at least tries to sort of play by the rules. So if you're a politics, this is true, it's rational business. So we're trying to be consistent. And what's interesting here is that this is sort of, it's not taken up, but it's just this inconsistency of this freedom of the fool. It's, it's that it brings us in by sort of reflecting here. So you seem to think that I'm somehow inconsistent, and he's joking, and he's making this sort of, and then he sort of skips over it, because these sort of rational, professionalized arguments are swept away. And I think this is interesting because this really shows us that there is a, a book on medieval carnivals and also on you know, early modern carnivals, a um, number of books uh, by Bartin. And Bartin writes about uh, the, the grotesque and the burlesque, carnivalesque humor of this period <coughs> as very typical of the Renaissance, but also um, he presents two giants, two giants in your book by Rabelais, Gargonzola and Pandeto, who are really outrageous. So they eat all the time and they are very immoderate and they laugh very loudly and they have sex and they defecate everywhere. So there is sort of out of boundsness and outrageousness that is there. And it's something of this outrageousness, of this freedom of doing whatever you want and not. So something of this outrageousness, I think, is seeping into the political style. I think Trump is probably the best example. He just breaks all the rules and takes everything he wants, and somehow it works for him and it doesn't get sanctioned because he takes up this freedom that is usually reserved for people who are outside of the system, and he takes it up. I think that's uh, fascinating because it does remind me so much of what about uh, Martin is writing. And Martin was writing this for the local court, was writing this in 1930s, 1940s Russia. Uh, and then it was critical of the system. So he was, he got into a lot of trouble with the Soviet so Union you know when he wrote this book, because the authorities clearly understood who he was talking to. So he was talking, while he was talking about the giants, he was really critiquing the communist system at the time. Uh, and giving a sort of an, alternative of this sort of freedom that was not there, but now we have this criticism all of a sudden, but it's at the heart of the political system. So it's a very odd reversal where the people who are in power take this freedom rather than freedom being wielded against the people in power. So this is, I think, the underlying sort of part of all the strategies. It's a taking up of a very specific kind of freedom that's 
means that the rules that are for me are not the rules that are for all the others, and it's accepted. Um, and then finally, uh, what happens in this new polarizing style is the laughter at others, so at other art groups, to cultivate in-group output feelings. Uh, and also to cultivate more serious effects. And this is actually where it becomes most painful, but also most difficult to grasp. So you'll see with all these politicians, you see that they attack other outgroups. Different ones, very often white groups, also sometimes women. But they do this in very uh, sort of careful, veiled ways very often. And it works also because social media helps. Uh, so sometimes, again, Donald Trump is always the best example because he does the real thing rather than the real thing that they do in Europe. So Trump, even when he was campaigning, he mocked a disabled reporter who so was saying there was this guy from the New York Times just like this, and everybody was laughing at him. And it didn't hurt him. So again, the fool's free. He, he did this, people were laughing, and somehow so many people said, oh, he, he can't come into the president if he does this, and he, he did. So Trump is the... Uh, also, Gerd Wilder, so the, the blonde weird guy from the Netherlands does this, so this is uh, a not very uh, uh, refined image of the Prophet Muhammad that he tweeted earlier by a well-known right-wing comedian. Uh, and what works, I like to compare this to billiards, which I'm sure you also play. So what they do, very often most politicians, they don't attack directly. They sort of carefully open the gate by using the humor and by referring to a number of groups. And then they sort of let things grow fully and they use social media very often to use this. And I think this is one of the very difficult things to capture. Also, when I write about this, this is where I get attacked also by trolls because there's a deniability of non-seriousness. Uh, but this is what happens, for instance. So the chair of Dutch Parliament is a woman, and she's also uh, of Moroccan descent. And what happens, both the right wing and the left wing political parties, they bait her. Because she's the chair of Parliament, so clearly she's the person who's always saying, you shouldn't be doing this, and this is please keep ordering, you know, like uh, verbal in the, so this is what happens. But because she's a woman and she's of Moroccan descent, this actually opens the door for a lot of insults, but also for a lot of joking at her expense. Uh, so this is the one that I uh, translated for you yesterday to see the sort of horror <coughs> that emerges in the comments to this. And this is actually very, very normal. Uh, so it's about the fact that she's a woman. It's about the fact that she's a migrant. Uh, I'm not going to read it to you, but you get the point. It's all not very nice. And very often it's also joking. So this was actually yesterday a very much shorter one. So what happens is that this transgressive, jokey behavior actually opens up a way for comments on social media to sort of for people to go further. So it lowers the barrier, it creates this jokey atmosphere, it quotes a number of art groups, and then of course these politicians say they say, well it's not us because it's the YouTube comments. So it's not us saying. We would never say something about Madam Chair of the Parliament, but it says what happens, but they do sort of open up. And I think this is actually something that we need to be researched further, also by the sort of work that linguists do, because I think this is one of the very complicated, very difficult to grasp sort of elements of this polarization, where this sort of jokey moves on the part of politicians sort of open up the gates to something that's much harsher because people and their followers can say much more and this is also where social media uh, comes in handy. Uh, and also again so this happens on both sides of the debate so it's also the, the same freedom party they also attack her so Khadija uh, Ali uh, so they attack her for not uh, standing up for immigrants in the Netherlands for not being real Muslim which she should be so it comes from both sides but for me, it's actually, this is a problem for me, it's actually much more difficult to read these comments because most of them are in Turkish. Uh, so. so to conclude, uh, what I'm trying to show you is that there are actually a number of ways in which the use of humor by politicians uh, in a number of countries um, 
not only mirrors but also con contributes to this ongoing polarization. So there is a number of ways in which humor can do this by directly drawing boundaries between the self and others, but also by creating group feelings, uh, by claiming a sort of freedom that makes possible saying a lot of things that would have been unthinkable a long time ago, but also by sort of opening some doors for people to say worse and worse things. And we know from also from psychological research that laughter actually has this capacity to lower some sort of emotional boundaries. So the work by Tom Ford shows that if you if you laugh at something, it becomes easier to say sort of more serious negative things about people. And this is something that is really that is even though they're probably not aware of it, is used very well by polarized extreme parties in Europe and in the US. Uh, so the problem is that it's actually very difficult to say this from many people to accept this because we like to think that humor is this really nice thing. It's good, it's pleasant, it's against the settled power, it's liberating. So humor is supposed to be a good thing. It's, it's satire is supposed to be great because it's you know, critical and it speaks to power and all this. So it's very hard for lay people, also for academics, to engage with the friends of this is really not a very nice way of using humor, people, maybe. Uh, and this ideology of satire is this really beautiful thing is something that is partly true. I mean, there is a very beautiful, long tradition of satire as an important force in democracy that's still there. But it can be, but humor is not one thing. So we also, oh, another example, I think maybe you know this too, I think we, it was very often, it's very well published by the way that the Chinese government clamps um, down on satire. And this really is like, like the story that we have of Latin. So we have this image of, we have totalitarian governments, and they hate humor. And that's because they're totalitarians. And we are not like that, so we are democracies, so we don't hate humor, so all humor should be wonderful. And this is not the way it works. So because it works one way, it doesn't work the other. So satire can be a good thing, but humor also is a complicated, ambiguous form of communication, as I said in the beginning, that makes possible a lot of different things, including things that I would think of as good, but also things that worry me, like its role in increasing polarization. Um, because what happened, the politics really has changed over the past. 30 years. So the role of media, the role of celebrity culture in politics, and politics is not about parties, it's about persons, something that, um, that political scientists call effective polarization, polarization in terms of the emotions you have uh, regarding other parties of the strong we group and they group feelings. This has changed, and this really makes you heard something that is now in politics rather than on the outside talking to politics. So, so the public sphere has changed. So social media really, so we're still trying to work out what social media is doing to how politics works because it has changed so much and it's still changing so much. It's really very difficult to grasp. But I remember when it still started and it seemed all very cool and now it's something that really uh, worries me sometimes. Uh, globalization has changed things to a large extent in the sense that we see sort of these tropes like the all right memes in many different places. So there is also the, nat the national boundaries don't work as much. So it's really become much sort of gotten much more out of control in that way. And then society also has changed, which means that now it's really the most important thing for a politician to have a good sense of humor because it means you're authentic and you're a real person and you're not a great bureaucrat and you pull on media. Inequality has changed, has grown in many places. So it's not a coincidence that these new uh, political leaders also are very rich. So the sense of freedom that they have, it's not just a sense of freedom because they're numerous, it's also a sense of freedom because they're so rich and so much elevated among us that they really have been brought up to think that the rules that apply to most people don't apply to them. So there is a big sort of shift in many societies that really makes humor work very differently now from how it worked uh, 20, 30 years ago. So that means I think we really have to understand that humor is not inconsequential. It's also not one thing. So there are very different sorts of humor and they can do many different things and humor in itself, I'm afraid, is not a good thing. It's just a thing that we can study. Thank you very much.